Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for, uh, for attending this uh, World Economic Forum event, uh, one of the World Economic Forum Lighthouse projects, focusing on um, decarbonizing the European food system, but, but more than just carbon. This is more than just a carbon story. So it's the EU Carbon Plus uh, program. Um, a new kind of coalition coming together to try and transition the food system to one that delivers environmental health, human health, and all the stuff in the middle that connects farming to consumers. Um, so, of course, the if you, if you, if you think about the food system in total, it amounts to around about 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And around a third of that happens in the farm. So two thirds of those emissions happen once the food leaves the farm and makes its way to the consumer. And a lot of that is waste, there's transport, there's packaging. Um, and you could argue that some of the food that we eat has been processed to the point where it's already waste, even if we eat it. Um, and so there's, 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 there's what, what is clear is that if we take a systems approach, in other words, if we look across the whole value chain and try to develop solutions across the whole value chain, there are such strong synergies, for example, between the demand side and the supply side, that if we try to, we know that if we try to solve the problems we have with biodiversity and climate, just focusing on production, we've got no chance. But if we look at the unsustainable consumption of food and the way that we use, and to, to some extent destroy the nutritional value of food once it leaves the farm, there is great opportunity to, realize a transition that can genuinely have a major impact um, on, on both climate and biodiversity, whilst having a whole bunch of other co-benefits that we know things that are already wrong with the food system that we can address in, in the meantime. So what the, um, the Carbon Plus Lighthouse program is trying to do is convene all of those stakeholders across the value chain but we start with the farmer at the center because, and I know there's some farmers in the audience here that will agree with this, it's the farmers that will make the, that will make the transition, that will, will, will transform our food system from the ground up. And we need to work with farmers to understand um, their ideas and their thinking and their innovations to understand how we can best support farming and farmers to help us deliver the transition and how that support can come from right across the value chain. How do we change the story of food? So we're gonna hear from a bunch of different uh, speakers from across the value chain. I come to this coalition with a sort of scientist hat on, um, because I, I run another uh, coalition focusing very much on soil health, where we're bringing science together with, uh, with corporates to try and address, again, from the ground up, some of the challenges in our food system. But the, the great thing about this project is it connects that very focused initiative to the whole value chain, recognizing that if you want to fix soil health, you've got to fix a hell of a lot of other stuff in the, in the value chain as well. So I have found this, uh, a extremely interesting process working with a whole bunch of people who are all trying to do the same thing but coming from very very different perspectives and we learn from each other no single organization can deliver this no single organization knows how to do it but together we can figure it out whilst we make a start on the ground because we recognize that time is running out we can't wait to imagine the perfect solution, we have to work with the best we can and get better at it. And we need to do that 
together. So the first speaker uh, gives me a huge pleasure to introduce uh, Christine from, uh, from Bayer, who's been uh, coordinating this herd of cats and, and turned us into a very diverse and disconnected group into what I think is a very coherent and passionate and driven consortium. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, John, for the introductions. Um, it's a pleasure today for, for being here and for representing the EU Carbon Farming Plus Coalition. So I want first to thank the uh, University of Glasgow and you, John, for inviting us uh, and to give us a stage to present where we are at today with, with these coalitions. And uh, so uh, the EU Carbon Plus Farming Coalitions is uh, a regional part of the uh, broader actions uh, led by the uh, World Economic Forum, around 100 million farmers, uh, transitioning towards net zero and the nature positive food systems. So um, with that, I'm going to um, give you a bit of context about from where we were coming from. And uh, agriculture today in Europe is responsible for more than 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is leading to climate change, but um, ecosystem degradations. With the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, the European Commission is having ambitious targets uh, to net your goals and uh, we as a coalition trying to support the commissions into implementing the Green Deal. And what we wanted to put at first is to address the farmers needs. And that's the reasons why we started from the farmers. The way we have been approaching is rather to say, hey, let's start to develop and design solutions for the farmers. Let's develop them with the farmers. And that's the reasons why we start to interview and survey farmers. We are targeting 1,800 farmers um, when it comes to better understand what are the orders, what are the road blockers to implement climate smart practices and to access public support. Then the second part of, of the project is about co-designing solutions. That means looking after scaling, impactful practices that can be implemented by the farmers with an economic relevance. And that means as all well to be driven by actions. It's not about having a nice recommendation, so, but hey, that would be the way farmers should be doing. It's about getting closer to the farmers and trying to set pilots, very operational action-driven pilots to try to change and transform agriculture for nature-based solutions. With that, um, we have been working and putting together a coalition of 14 very outstanding, motivating, and fully energized companies. And uh, we're having a weekly call and exchanging a lot. Uh, we are supported by amazing companies uh, who are driving us towards step-by-step um, -step approach. And again, I want to repeat that we are working closely with the farmers, not only about asking what they need, but also looping in the conversations about pilot designs and solutions supported by Copa Cogeca and CGR. I want to say here again that we are very multidisciplinary. It's about agribusiness, food industry, digital company, insurance, and academia. We have been working into selecting in a few months. So the coalition is pretty new. It um, has been set up and launched in May. And we have been working into designing 10 crop country combinations which have been selected because of the relevance in terms of potentials for carbon reductions, scalable, having a high attractiveness towards the food processing industry, and a high consumer appealance to the crop and end products, meaning potatoes, for example, wheat as well. So we have been figuring out that we will select for this work six cropping system representing more than 40% of the farmers of the European total arable crops and seven countries. So in total, you need to keep in mind, we will be working with 10 crop country combinations. 
Today, we are still processing the old data that we are collecting. So I will be presenting to you three, four major uh, crop systems that we have been analyzing. So which is around 30% of the completions of the data that I'm going now to present and I'm happy to hear back from the panel afterwards. So um, the work we have been doing is um, a methodology we have been facing, uh, ut utilize is about very robust, statistically relevant and the stepwise approach and does the entity data and IPSOS requirements and push. We have been working towards farmer survey. We are doing now a deep dive analysis on the regulations landscape. And of course, considerations around monitoring, reporting, and verifications approach that could be today manageable and for the future. Here now uh, about the results that we're having now. So the preliminary, the preliminary results that we're having showcase that we have identified four major pain areas. The first one is about awareness and knowledge from the farmer's perspective. There are also issues regarding financing and risk management. Data governance, it's key at the farm level. And policy and regulations, while there are a lot to support farmers, are pretty confusing today. But let me explain a bit further in details what do we mean by that. So when we are looking after knowledge and awareness of the farmers, they perfectly know their operations they know what to do but they are confused when we asking questions about carbon farming they are confused about connecting practices with climate change or practices with carbon sequestrations so there is a gap into knowledge that we need to address and when you and we talk about the benefits they clearly understand that there is a benefit from a eco, from, from an environmental standpoint but they do not see the value, the economic value for them. It needs to, still needs to be figured out about how they can benefit from doing carbon farming. The second app approach that we have been doing regarding the um, digital solutions, there is obviously a lower adoption of tech enabled climate smart practices like sensors or GPS harvesters, for example, that today have limited knowledge and understanding how to use them and benefit from an operational standpoint. And when you look on the right hand, when they stand about the barriers to the adoptions of tech enabled climate smart practices, the first thing they're asking for is about knowledge, how it will be fitting their own operations, what at the same time investment. It costs money to invest into digitalization. It costs money to invest in, in sensors, to gather data gathering and data transparency. It's also a high cost for the farmers and they address it. Let's move on now on the risk man management. Changing practices, always required agronomic knowledge, economic savvy, but as well a great understanding about how it will impact the farms. The first pain points the farmers are uh, uh, explaining having are around the ex uh, excessive change of the weather. They have to cope with major drought, with major flooding, and they have not covered sufficiently today by economic solutions, incentives, or insurance. It's difficult for them to be covered and to be safe towards this, um, this uh, investment. So this is a risk that needs still to be addressed with the farmers. When we are looking afterwards around um, the shift to when non practices for the adoptions of new climate smart practices, it represents a risk to the operations, but as well for the income revenue. And here again, you can see the barriers and the uh, perceptions of the incentives. The first barriers that are always stated by the farmers are around financing. And also how for more than 30%. And then afterwards, again, about awareness and knowledge. When it comes to money and incentive, there are farmers asking for de-risk solutions. 
and to get a recurrent uh, support from a financial point of view. So, and uh, I must say the second one, which is very important, advice. And where, from where they can get reliable advice towards changing climate smart practices and selecting the right uh, technologies in order that it fits their own operations. Let's put it now um, another important information, which is around the digitalizations on the farm data. We have been asking the farmers if they are doing uh, carbon sampling and carbon analyzing. And you can see here from today analysis that we're having, which is partial again, it's mainly Eastern countries driven, but only 3% of the farmers are stating that they are doing carbon, carbon analysis, carbon soil analysis. And 11% might think about it. The rest are not doing it. And when they are doing it, it is collected into a sheet of paper and they are putting it in a folder. There is nothing aligned which is about having digital, digitalized information, which can be bring directly to the next level of the value chain. Here, we need to think further around how we can standardize and support the farmers into digitalizing their operations and data management, keeping, of course, their data privacy safe. Now come the last point, which is around the policies. We have been doing a very deep dive analysis around uh, the policies which are today under preparations. So today within the, uh, political, the common agriculture policy, it is of course the most relevant and powerful policy to support the farmers in meeting the net zero and nature positive agriculture. Today, they're receiving greening payment. They're implementing and maintaining three practices. They get rewards for th three practices. In the future situation, the future cap, this will be transitioned through national strategic plans. We have been analyzing deep dive Germany, Poland, and Spain, national strategic plans, which are preparing eco scheme to support payment to farmers for single uh, practices. We figure out that they have eco scheme for 31 different practices and only 50% are common toward the other countries. This is difficult to address. For the farmers, pretty, what they are saying as well is that they understand they are money flow. That's a great news. But they are also saying that they don't know how to access it. And from an administration standpoint, this is complex. For companies like us, which are acting internationally, that would be also a challenge to pick up a scalable practices because we will need to adapt to each and every countries. And the scalability will be then limited. That sounds great that we're having flows for money and support, great, but that still needs a huge work to understand how best Broad companies can support the farmers to implement the practices and be rewarded for doing the right things. My last slide is about going up in the next steps. So we are working now into finalizing the analysis of all the cropping system I was mentioning earlier. We are going to now crack the nuts and analyzing and working with farmers associations to understand what would be the best solutions from what the farmers are telling us, how could look like a pilot which is scalable at the European level, even thinking further. So we are going to work on the next weeks with the farmers associations and the farmers based on the analysis we have been doing on the field taking into consideration, uh, into consideration the regulations and the monitoring, reporting and verifications, which will, will make a carbon farming plus case. By early next year, we will be able to propose pilot designs for European systems in order that we can scale and impact. You are invited to join and to bring together a more, even more diversified community standing for decarbonizing the EU carbon system. 
that would be my last quote then. Thanks, Christine. So thanks everyone and welcome. I'm Lisa Sweet with the World Economic, World Economic Forum and very loud. It sounds like I'm screaming here, so hopefully. You're okay with that. I'm just wondering if we can pull up the visual of our panelists who are joining remotely. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here today speaking as part of the COP ecosystem and really having the opportunity to bring agriculture and food systems into the discussion in a real way and to showcase a coalition that really has been operating so fast so collectively to build trust, to understand and unpack some of the challenges within the European ecosystem specifically, and critically to get to that next stage of driving action. Um, this is not about that blah, blah, blah. It's really about unpacking the pain points and getting to the point where we can make changes that actually impact what's happening on the ground. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce a really fabulous panel that we have here today to reflect on the early stage results which Christine has presented to us and to talk about the role that they have in the value system, in the value chain, in the food ecosystem uh, to drive change and, and what is their role and responsibility in the next phase and in these next steps. Um, so first I will do a round of introductions and then we'll go on to the conversation. Uh, really thrilled to have Deanna Lindsay, who is the president of SAJA, the European Council of Young Farmers, who's joining us representing the young farmer voice. She's also a farmer herself. Then next, Christian Holitner, and I apologize because I'm going to mispronounce everybody's name, so hopefully you don't mind, but really thrilled to have the head of unit for land use and finance for innovation from the Directorate General of Climate Action of the European Commission, who's really been playing this critical role in the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Christine Crosby, the Sustainability, Sustainability Director from Harrow Group, and Alex Bell, who's joining us in the room from the Agoro Carbon Alliance as the CEO from Yara International. And finally, Jörg, um, Hostetter, uh, the Associate Professor in Supply Chain Management at Kedge Business School and President of the International Forum of Sustainable Value Chains. So really thrilled to have this group here. As the first question, I want all of our panelists to be reflecting on what they just heard from Christine's presentation, from the early stage results, from listening to the farmers on their understanding, on the pain points, on the analysis that we've done on the complexity of regulation that's coming through. Um, how can the agriculture and food sector and the ecosystem of, of actors that surround this system empower the farmers in Europe to accelerate the transition to net zero nature positive agriculture? The first question I have to the panelists is what is the one key insight that you've taken away from the early stage results and how can that insight be a powerful lever for change? So first I'm gonna to go to Deanna for her reflections. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to be a part of this panel. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I must say what I really take at heart of it is the, the whole idea that everything needs to be co-designed, that we cannot find solutions for farmers without involving the farmers. And this is fundamental for us as, as young farmers, as probably the ones who more than anyone else will have to bring this transition to accomplishment, will have to really uh, drive this transition and, and get to the results that we are all uh, in need of. Um, the idea of co-designing, of really involving at, at uh, root level, but also with this, uh, um, this concept of co-designing through a science-based, root-based approach that gives and can deliver practical, pragmatic, uh, applicable solutions for farmers is, is very important for us. And it's why we're so happy to be a part uh, of this process, because it's really important for us to make sure that we find solutions that farmers can uh, want to um, implement, that they can afford to implement, and that they can uh, implement at policy level, because sometimes we see that there isn't that 
regulatory framework where the solutions that are fine found can actually then be applied. So absolutely the idea of uh, centralizing farmers in a, in a co-designing with other actors and stakeholders, uh, some pragmatic solutions I think is what is very, very important for us as young farmers. Thanks, Deanna, and we'll come back to you a little bit later in the panel. Christian, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, what was your one key insight, and, and what do we do with that insight? Okay, good, good afternoon. Very, very happy to be, to be with you. Um, and I think it's great to see all these initiatives on, on carbon farming, mushrooming, all over, all over Europe. Uh, but I think what you also said, it's time to scale up uh, these solutions and to bring more clarity, transparency to the market and to create um, kind of a European model of carbon of carbon farming. And, and this is something we can do, we can do in Brussels, or creating European markets, that's, um, that's our job. And, um, and I think this is what we want to do with our communication that's upcoming on, on 14th of December, sustainable carbon cycles, where we want to, to, to start this European model of carbon farming where we can see how can it fit into the European uh, context, which is very much the common agricultural policy. And they said, we have there some uh, very powerful um, tools on also financial support, but we also need to see how can we mobilize uh, private, uh, private money into this and how can we create uh, more clarity in terms of uh, how do we monitor our emissions? Uh, how can, uh, the rewards look like and how can we really create there something that can be understood uh, on all sides in Europe on the farmers so that it's easy for them to join um, such schemes but also at the ones who want to finance more sustainable uh, farming so be it uh, public bodies or be it also the bigger food processors or other uh, other companies that want to come in and are um, maybe interested in, uh, in investing uh, into more sustainable farming, into carbon uh, removals. And uh, this is what, what we need to be looking at over the next years. Excellent. Thank you, Christian, for, for those insights from Brussels. And we appreciate you sharing what you're doing and, and what your outlook is on what you're doing next. Christine, I'm going to come to you next. The other Christine, not the one sitting here, but the one that you mm -hmm. see behind me on the screen from Harrow Group. What was your one key insight? So good afternoon. Hi, Lisa. Um, from a food company point of view, um, I think the key insight is we're, we're in the middle of the food chain. So we're working with farmers and suppliers of our food products. And we're also very much linked to our channel partners and everything that we're doing and the food products that we're making from baby foods to marmalades are for our end consumers. So for us, a key takeaway in our active engagement and the learning in the coalition, I think the key insight to date is that there is absolutely a business case for climate friendly farming. And it's our responsibility collectively to really um, uh, raise the awareness, as Christine mentioned, um, uh, put together clear incentive structures and start to enable but I think the key insight is a positive one in terms of from our consumers and our customers point of view from the channel partners, as well as more and more farmers and suppliers, we're seeing the an economic and an environmental benefit from climate friendly farming. Excellent. Really love the, the positivity and especially coming off of the last session on soil health. There were these questions on the business case um, and we'll be getting to some of that later. Alex, going to come to you next for your insight. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> and, and really building on what I've heard across uh, the, the panelists and, and coalition members uh, here today, um, it, it really, for me, the, the main insight coming out of, of the work we've been doing in the coalition um, has really been around the need, not only to, uh, uh, around knowledge and awareness, um, to define what we're talking about. People bandy about, words, you know, climate smart farming, regenerative farming, conservation farming, would, you know, uh, all of these terms, what are we talking about? And then over time, the need to accompany farmers in succeeding to make these things work. Because it's one thing to have a set of incentives and, and having a clear definition, but this is hard work and this is hard work over years. 
and the ability to work closely with farmers um, on their terms, in their field, literally, uh, to help them succeed is frankly what is needed as a, a necessary precondition um, if this is going to work for the climate, uh, but also for the farmers and the rest of the value chain. Excellent. Uh, much more clarity needed, but I love this term, need to accompany the farmers. And reflecting back to Deanna's comment, how do we work hand in hand co-design and think of this as a journey that we're on together, not something that we push down to the farmers and make them do. Uh, this is about what all of us can do collectively and what we need to do collectively. Jörg, over to you for your key insight. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this panel on this highly important topic. This is great work and very necessary and great to see so many different organizations actively contributing in this project. And the interesting results that have been achieved in this very short time since the project kicked off. Um, let me focus on my remarks on that understanding of farmer challenges. Uh, it's highly important to ensure everyone's awareness of the situation of the farmer. So I'm going over to uh, Diana Lancy's point. On the farm level, a broad lack of awareness about the various climate smart practices, lack of understanding of the possible business case, the lack of capabilities and hands on experiences there, and the worry about financial issues to be core problems for the farmers. Well, I think this farming is quite heterogeneous in farm size and materials produced, in levels of technologies applied, in values and norms, and being part of uh, a very rigid network or not. So there's a lot of different things out there. And your sample suggests uh, that the respondents predominantly replied for the case of smaller farmers. And I think that's very important to see that difference. And I'd like to know more about that, Teton. It seems to me we have to further invest into our empathy on farmers to understand why they do what they do. And the study results give excellent insights where to drill deeper. Let me say it differently. Instead of speaking about farmers, we need to speak with them. The question is why farmers do what they do? Why do they act against their own interests? And how can we approach these causalities that we see there to realize the aspired changes? Many farmers tell me that what they are discussing with their customers that is important to their business is primarily one thing, price. And for some materials, it's also quality and what that is meant is technical quality. And the pressure is clear, cheaper price with constant or increased technical quality. And at the same time, climate change is causing higher costs and that consumes margins. As farmers, we have less money, less mind space, less time to invest into environmental issues and that can quickly turn into a vicious circle. So I think congratulations to the project to investigate into the challenges from the farmers and uh, to really think with them about what are the problems. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jorg. It's great to kind of hear that perspective as well. I, I think that, um, you know, getting to the heart of why farmers do what they do is part of the process that we've actually laid out and the setup with this coalition that we have plans for in the future, working with Deanna and the farmers uh, that she works with and represents and other far farmers organizations as well. The survey is, is starting to unpack those details, but then to take that one layer down to co-design solutions is really where we get into uh, the meat of being able to create these solutions that, that will hold weight um, for the changes that need to come. I'm gonna come back to you, Jorg, uh, for a second question. And this question is really uh, not wear wearing your professor hat, but wearing the hat that you have around sustainable value chains and the forum that you conduct on that. Many downstream companies are setting these ambitious targets for nature, for climate. There's scope three targets that are out there. Um, what do you think those companies envisage as their role in helping the farmers to transition? Well, thank you for that question. I think that's very important to, to think downstream here. I think uh, from the big brands, there are many efforts directed to improving sustainability in farming since decades, at least for specific materials and for specific world regions. These efforts are usually collective initiatives and since many brands cannot directly link to the specific farmers, they go the approach of changing the entire sector together with other big brands. That's what we call a collective approach. But let's bear in mind collective action with competing competitors does not lead to competitive advantage. 
And that's where money really is invested in. And that's what creates future returns and increases the market share and the margins, et cetera. So there are questions about how successful these collective actions and sustainability have been so far. And aside from the competitive advantage argument, the key problem seems to be the disconnect between the big brands and the farmers. So the many middlemen in between, from traders to producers, et cetera. Important for that distant downstream companies is to also invest into changing the business practices in these intermediate stages, the, what I'd call the middlemen. That brings me to an interesting observation that's that some branded good companies in food and also beyond food have started in changing their procurement practices from the conventional market-based approach and saying what's available right now over to a relationship-based approach and saying with whom do we create longer term relationships where the alignment on values plays a central role. And after all, we're, what we talk about in sustainable business practices, we're talking about values. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jörg. I'm gonna to come to Christine next. I think that's a great segue to actually talk about, talk to the brand on the panel um, and get your reflections on, on what Jörg just said. What is the, the role of the big brands? What is the role of your procurement policies? How do you as a brand really drive the changes throughout the chain that start on the farm, which is potentially many steps removed from you? That's a great question. And I fully agree with what Jörg was saying. Um, in essence, if we take a quick step back, so for most food companies, the large players like the Nestle's and the Danons and the mid-sized players like we are at Hero, 55 to 60% of our environmental footprint is absolutely in the supply chain procurement space, as Jörg had mentioned. And as we've looked around and through exchange on coalitions like this, um, and also a lot of peer interactions and peer discussions, fully agree at the heart of our sustainability strategy and our actions is supplier relationship management. And as Jörg mentioned, it is complex. So for us, as I mentioned, you know, baby foods and snacks and marmalades, our cropping is fruits and vegetables and cereals and dairy. So it's very complex. We don't have one big lever like a cocoa or a sugar where we, we have very diverse ingredients. And in those diverse ingredients, of course, the, the value chain is also very unique. So we have some large dairy suppliers and cereal suppliers who are further along on the climate friendly farming um, uh, journey and have clearer sustainability targets. So partnering there is, um, how shall I say, short term, uh, more accessible. And then we have highly fragmented um, fruit and vegetable suppliers, especially for our organic baby food products. And that requires a lot of one-on-one -on, -one on farm engagement. And exactly what Jörg mentioned, it's this context of coming up with a collective set of uh, sustainable agri principles uh, and using the learns like from this coalition to identify where the greatest levers are for the environment and also for the social benefits. So I, in, in that context, I think if I were to summarize where we are with our sustainable sourcing transformation, which is almost exclusively about procurement, the emphasis there is we're looking at our existing set of suppliers, working more closely and partnering with our suppliers and with the direct farmers and coming up with a, a common set of goals and principles for the implementation. But it's this absolute long-term journey and it's multi-cropping seasons so we have to set a foundation and then continuously uh, have on-farm engagement and uh, seasonal data gathering. Thanks, Christine. I'm gonna to flip to Alex, because I think what you were saying, it just in terms of um, getting to the levers and understanding them requires some commonality of goals and principles. Alex, I know kind of one of, one of the key points for you is really how do we get to that alignment? Um, what is the role that businesses play? I think oftentimes uh, people want to separate the business from the scientists. And there's a lot of complexity as John has alluded to uh, kind of many, many times on the science and many others allude to. Uh, there's also a reality of business that, that wants to make things a bit more simple and nimble and move a bit faster. Some of the science is still coming uh, and we don't necessarily have five to 10 years to wait to get that science perfect. 
Um, so, so what is the role of business in, in helping to accelerate some of that process? No, absolutely. Great question. I mean, I think it, it starts with, it starts with action and it starts with action now and developing the business cases and iterating those business cases, cases and recognizing that maybe we don't always have all the answers and that sometimes the science isn't completely, completely there, but that we need to start working on the solutions that could work now in order to have a chance to have the solutions that will work tomorrow. <laughs> um, what that means in practice, it means very, very tangibly working on the different ways that farmers can monetize these practice changes. If the farmer cannot monetize this practice change, this practice change will not happen. Business can help the farmer by incentivizing the farmer through market mechanisms to achieve those changes. And this is you know, sort of this idea of awareness and knowledge of how do you change your practice and how do you do so successfully so that it actually increases the profitability of the farm over time, increases the attractiveness of farming, ensures food security over time in a way that can generate um, you know, lower carbon ingredients for food companies or, or indeed carbon removals for, for companies that, uh, that require those to meet their uh, carbon and uh, climate pledges. So from a, from a private sector point of view, it's really this mobilization of, of, of the science and of markets for the sake of practical immediate action. Great, and, and Deanna, hopefully that's music to your ears, the sake of immediate action and the ability for farmers to monetize. Can you talk a little bit about the, the young farmer perspective on where the opportunities are right now to monetize and, and really what you're asking from a coalition such as this or from others in the ecosystem to bring to bear to help the farmers be rewarded and recognized for the changes that are being driven at the farm level. And yes, yeah. it is music to my ears. Thank you very <laughs> much, Lisa. Uh, because uh, young farmers are, are trying to set up businesses that can be viable uh, in the long term. So they are looking at all the possible uh, new ways at uh, approaching farm systems. We talked about the fact that there is a huge diversity uh, of of farm systems, of crops, but also of ways to access market. And that's kind of the beauty of, of my, my role is to take all of this in and try to uh, understand all of those needs and create harmony when we then go and talk to policymakers. Because what we need right now, and it seems like sometimes this is it's almost a bad word to be using, is certainty. We have right now a huge opportunity in front of us. We are looking at something that we have never done. How do we measure uh, what the positive impact of farming is? We've measured all of the negative ones up to yesterday. <laughs> now we can actually measure the positive ones, but if we don't measure them in a way that creates certainty for the farmer, for the policymaker, for the bank who's paying you for that carbon sequestration and for the consumer, because we must always put the consumer in the loop. We need to recreate that relationship of trust that consumers know what they're eating that this uh, wonderful word that this uh, sentence that was used the climate friendly farming what is it how do we make it really real how do they how can they rely on the fact that they're not just being sold a slogan that farmers are doing their part so right now we have this great challenge and opportunity and creating certainty, creating measurability, creating um, systems that can be replicable at different farm levels and that recognize the diversity of farming is what we're really working on at SEJA. I mean, I represent 32 different young farmers associations from 23 member states in Europe, which means I represent all sorts of farmers, but I also represent a minority. Um, the fact that right now, or actually only in, in 2016, only 11% of farms were run by someone under the age of 40 is a very preoccupying piece of information that should really have all of our the hairs on the, the back of our neck stand up. Because if we care to continue eating, we need to enable a new generation of farmers to come in to the farming system, to actually be able to create sustainable livelihoods for their communities, for, for their farms, and to take 
all of the new um, instruments that we have, the, the technology, the research, the data, the digitalization, the carbon sequestration, and, and put all of this into a new sustainable farming uh, model that can be repl replicable while it respects the diversity of European farming. Thanks, Diana. And Christian, I'm going to come to you as the last comment on the panel, and then we will open it up for Q&A with the audience. Uh, would love to just hear your reflections. I think diversity and complexity keep coming up over and over. Transparency, how do we bring that into the equation? Um, you know, you're operating from the DG Klima. There's other DGs, Agri, INPA, others who are also trying to struggle and integrate here. How do, how do we make sense of it all? I think oh, what, 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 uh, what Diana also just said is, we need credibility. We need someone who invests into this, someone who wants, who's ready to pay a premium for this new type of farming, must be assured that one ton of carbon is stored in the soils, in the forests, and for how long it's stored there. And if we don't get this very basic measurability right, uh, it will be very difficult. And this is something we know from our experience, also from other uh, carbon markets, carbon trading, and, and so on. So we absolutely need to get uh, the certification right, the monitoring, the verification, however you want to, to call this. And on this, we must build then the different financial incentives. Right? And, and I think what is very, very good with, with carbon, it's something measurable. You can really make something credible. Uh, you can really build a credible market on, uh, on, on this. And then we must see how can we uh, mobilize uh, the big food producers, the consumers, to, uh, to recognize these additional efforts that we are doing. How can we uh, incentivize public bodies, the common agricultural policies, uh, the different agricultural ministries, the climate ministries, to invest more into this. Eh? And just look at what, what Denmark is proposing. Uh, also the discussion in Germany, like in Finland, that there are very good examples that's, that's coming up. Eh? And then what always we need to, to, to do in Europe is we need to find this compromise between the diversity that we have, and that's good. And we need the transparency, the scalability at European uh, uh, level. And on this, on this we must uh, we must work so and i think this is also what we want to do here is on the one hand we want to get the standardization in the certification in the measurability so very technical things and then also how can we uh provide more more public money into this i think the common agricultural policy can really help the farmers to uh to cover these first investments also we must look into risk sharing I think also there, the common agricultural policy can, can do something. Uh, we can also look how, for example, the, um, the revenues from our current emission trading systems can be better used maybe to, to finance additional efforts in, uh, in carbon farming. So I think there are very exciting times ahead of us. And I think if we use the next one or two years wisely, uh, we can take a big step ahead. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, John, before I go to you to answer or pull up what some of the questions are, because I know you've been monitoring the questions online, I just want to pick up uh, briefly on the plus. We're the Carbon Plus Farming Coalition. Can you give those in the audience, those who weren't here for the last panel, just a taste of what is the plus in that equation? What are we looking for and why is this of value? Do you have a mic? You might have to stand at the podium. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I can do that now. Uh, and just briefly, um, so carbon, um, particularly in the agricultural system, um, has a huge number of co-benefits. Uh, and these, these co-benefits have both private and public value. And if we just focus on, on carbon in soil, which is where I'm most uh, familiar, um, if you get carbon into soil, you improve, um, 
you improve soil at an invisible level. Um, so that the, the structures in soil that are critical for holding on to water and nutrients are engineered, if you like, by the interaction between physical and biological processes in soil that are powered by carbon. So if you get carbon flowing through the soil system, the soil organizes itself in such a way that its capacity to hold water and to um, hold nutrients and, and move these quickly to the plants becomes very significantly enhanced. Um, that means you've got a much more productive system. It's more resilient because there's more storage in it. And it's also more efficient in the sense that because the there's more of this uh, fine scale structure that lets air into the system, soil metabolism is much more efficient. It's aerobic, microbes and soil need oxygen just like the rest of us. When they've got enough oxygen and carbon, they can, they can operate at maximum efficiency. If the, if the soil is not so healthy, um, then the become less efficient and a consequence of that is they release nitrous oxide, methane, uh, which are very potent greenhouse gases. If you change the, the, the capacity of, of soil to hold on to water, um, you change the hydrology of a catchment. So if you're in a flood prone, flood prone area, which is quite a lot of areas in Scotland, um, if you enhance the soil on your property, you reduce the risk of flooding downstream in urban areas. All of these have benefits, which currently the farmer does for nothing. And if we realize the full benefit that farming delivers to society and to business, and then pay farmers accordingly, the opportunity to drive change and incentivize change and move things much more quickly becomes so much greater. Thank you. Uh, great recognition. So I might have to leave you up there as you moderate with the online Q&A. <laughs> so don't leave the podium yet. Uh, in the meantime, maybe we can turn to, are you ready to go with a question there? Yeah, there's a million. Perfect. Pick one. Well, um, and then we'll also come to the audience for some questions as well. So what I'd like to just pick up on is point that was made earlier, because I'm not picking up on somebody in, online is picking up on it about this issue of complexity. And for me, it's a it's an issue that's quite close to my heart, because if you work in in anything to do with nature, or humans, um, you're immediately presented with an overwhelming complexity and engineering, we understand how engineered systems work, because we build them. When we try to understand natural systems, we actually don't know how they work. And we probably are not able to predict how they evolve in the future. So in face of all the complexity that we have in the food system, some of that is nature, some of that is human. Um, and of course, humans are part of nature. And so there's an interaction between those things. You've got an enormous complexity. The, in face of that complexity, you either crumble or you figure out, well, what's the first thing we should do? So, so Gary Metcalf uh, has, has posted a question. Um, where do you start? What part of the current supply chain most needs to change? For instance, meat production is a very big part, but changing that could dramatically affect basic diets. Or is the plan to keep all of the current actors, but make only incremental changes? I'd open it up to the panel to see who wants to come in on that one. Where do we start? Do we change everything all at once or do we start in a particular place? <laughs> Alex. I can start. I'll Go start. for it. Um, I think I'm gonna pick up a theme that I've heard about 13 times uh, since <laughs> I've arrived here in Glasgow. It's not either or, it's both. Uh, I think that you need to start um, with practical, tangible things that you know work. And as you start applying those, you will also unlock and uncover the bigger, more systemic and disruptive things that you can do. But I think you really need to challenge yourself to start with what can work and what can work today. So, you know, and, and 
that can look differently in different cropping systems and in, and in different environments. But we do know both in academia and in the private sector, and indeed farmers know best what it is that they can do and what it is that they can change on farm to make a meaningful, measurable climate impact on how food is produced today. So all of the above. Uh, did anybody else have another comment that they wanted to jump in with in response to that from the panel? The, the one, so the, yeah, the one comment I would have is, um, especially to um, John's question around the complexity or the frame of complexity, is from a private sector, from a food company point of view, we we're trying to take this in a step by step phased approach. So we're coming back to our greenhouse gas evaluation of where we have the greatest environmental footprint, both carbon and also biodiversity and land use, and then structure our actions accordingly. So it's not a panacea, but it's a bit also what Alex mentioned of having a, a, a multi-lever approach, but focusing in on the areas within our food value chain that are creating the greatest environmental impact first. And I think those assessments, those science-based targets, the understanding of, of where you, any individual can drive their changes are so critical because they are science-based and they do allow for that pathway of interaction at the individual level, which can be complemented by actors from across the value chain. Uh, next question. So there's, there's a general theme around um, carbon in the value chain. Um, so there's, there's a, some people asking about, um, let's say Europe mm -hmm. takes this bold step to decarbonize the food system. What about imports? Are we just exporting the carbon? Should we keep those credits within the food system? Um, because as you know, there's a lot of organizations out there willing to buy carbon from farmers that are external to the food system. Um, so what's your comment, I guess, what, what would be the answer to the question of how do we make sure we don't export our carbon um, to other food systems? And what about the dilemma that farmers face with um, being presented with so many opportunities to sell their carbon? Over to the panel. And Christine, you can also jump in if you wish on these comments. I'll make Maybe. a start while somebody is, 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 oh, you got somebody? No, go. I was just go gonna ahead. say that my recommendation for farmers would be to keep it in the food system, um, and keep it in the value chain, um, uh, because the food system needs all the help we can get, first of all, but also it, it might cut you out uh, if you sell it outside the food, food chain, it, it may cut you out from uh, from being able to participate in whole value chain um, solutions uh, that, that aim to to minimize the the carbon footprint of that value chain. Somebody and maybe else? over to Deanna. Yeah. Yes. As and a farmer, do you care, or is it just we do credit that you can get? No, no, we do, and because we also see the the risk it, that. It could increase on the pressure on uh, on farmland, and so absolutely, it is um, it is one of our, our biggest concerns how we regulate this market, and it is one of our greatest concerns how we, in a way, we don't want to have a, a per se protective system. But uh, what we see is that if the farming system has to do this this major step forward and um, and and change its ways, invest in, in sustainability, and uh, achieve the, these major targets, we need to be sure that there is coherence between all of the different policies that regulate Europe, that we are not uh, ecologically dumping our unsustainability outside of the market and therefore importing. So we need a level playing field with uh, when it comes to import and exports that can reward even more the European farmers for the work they are doing and that they are absolutely willing to do. So it's not about wanting to be protective or using this as an excuse to then say that the, the goal isn't achievable. The goal is achievable. It will take major sacrifice. It will take investments. It will take a lot. 
of collective efforts. But once we achieve the, this, this, this goal, we can't have then the problem coming in from the back window we left open. Great. Um, I'm gonna, we have a farmer in the room from Australia. So I think we're gonna turn to you. I don't know if you're commenting on this or questioning it. So I just thought I had something to add to the discussion. And can you introduce yourself? Um, sorry, as well? sorry, uh, uh, Alistair McLeod. I'm a livestock farmer in Australia. Um, we actually sold the carbon offsets off the back of our operations earlier on this year, a, a soil carbon offset. Um, so the question that you were asking, John, about should you keep that carbon within the food system or should it be sold as an offset? Of course, let's keep it in the food system. Love to, but it's a lot easier to sell it as an offset, I'm afraid. So until the food supply chain can provide an insetting mechanism for me to sell my beef as a carbon positive meat, which I could do, but, but the supply chain is not capable of doing that yet. Uh, I would love to do that. I would love to be selling all our commodities as carbon positive, but it's complex. Getting the, getting the supply chain to operate in a way that I can do that is complex. And maybe Christine can comment on, on Yeah, on I'm that. just going to open that because that needs a response. I mean, from what, what I can say is I'm going to repeat. I feel like I'm repeating myself. It's again, it's not either or. It's a false choice, I think, because I think that uh, you're absolutely right that the, the business cases for the full value chain to reward the farmer for that are not always in existence, whereas in some cases you already have removal markets uh, that are nascent, but that are there. So I think it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of iteration, in terms of innovation, not just of what happens technically on the field, but what opportunities we can put in front of farmers to incentivize lasting change that makes sense on the farm for you. Yeah, um, my, my perspective, so from a, from a buyer perspective, I think that what is key is that um, we need to take advantage of, of the collective willingness to go forward into uh, this carbon business and uh, to encourage initiative cross-border. Uh, but we need to acknowledge as well that agriculture is working with nature and there is a lot of regulations and rules which needs still to be clarified when it's come, it comes to scoping activities. What is an inset? How is the offset? What are the principles which needs to be implemented? And how we are going to monitor and verify. And so there is a lot of effort here that still needs to be developed in order that we have a full understanding about how and who is going to claim what. Ultimately, it needs to benefit to the farmers. That's really my convictions because they are the ones who will be transforming the food system. However, I think there is still some work to be done into clarifying the principles about how do you account? How do you measure? How do you make it clear to everyone about who is claiming what in setting of setting? But that's really as all the paths we need to go all together. And there's a lot of discussions happening right down the street on some of these key issues right now. Christian, I didn't know if you wanted to come in from the policy side. No, and, and I think that that's a good moment because I can only only agree with um, with this and what this is what I said before. We need to get the certification right if we want to have um, a sustainable market for the future there. And and I think we are creating something where we talk like in a, in a twenty fifty perspective. Right? We need to kick off all of this. Right? And there, are, as I said, there are a lot of good initiatives around, and we need to do a lot of learning, and we should uh, foster all of them. At the same time, we need to scale up and we need to create um, a long-term market. And as I said before, the ones who finance it need to be sure what they buy. Or as you also said, said before, it's invisible in the soil eh? and we must make it visible. Eh? We must be sure there is an additional ton of carbon stored and for how long is it stored? And who takes the risk if... Um, um, if there's, if there's a disturbance. Huh? So we really need to create a very credible, reliable market uh, for, for that. And uh, so, and this is also why I would think over the next years, uh, we need to gain a lot of experience on, on, on that. Uh, and this is also why uh, we make it um, like really a focus also with our research programs under Horizon Europe. Uh, we have a dedicated mission on soils there. 
where we will address a lot of these uh, a lot of these questions. And once and there are for certain practices where we understand it already better, like the rewetting of uh, of peatlands, uh, agroforestry. There are others where we still need more research to to understand this. So there are, I think, a lot of things where we can already go ahead. Others where we need more more research, eh? and we need a good dialogue on uh, on this to take this uh, this forward. But I think the overall goal is to create a credible, reliable market for the future, and on which everyone, the one who sells and the one who buys, in whichever way, be it within um, the agri value chain, be it outside, knows what is sold, what is bought. And, and I think in this discussion, okay, is it outside, inside? Uh, I mean, we, we've given out uh, this, this challenge or this milestone that the European uh, agriculture and forestry sector should be climate neutral by 2035. So this is our next milestone on which we also want that carbon farming uh, contributes to. But of course, going forward, achieving what we want to do in, in 2050, we of course need uh, uh, much more carbon removals. Huh? And, and we need to have a good discussion on what uh, should the agriculture, the land sector do in terms of, uh, of 2050 huh? in the production of food, in the, uh, in the production of biomass, also as, as an industrial feedstock, and in terms of, uh, of carbon removals, of the storage of CO2 in the, um, in the soils, forests, and then of course, further on, in, in the value chain, if it's, uh, if it's biomass and you can also have temporary carbon storage there in products like uh, woody construction material. So there's a whole new world and many new uh, value chains uh, uh, coming towards us. Lots of work to be done. John, maybe the last question coming in. Okay, I'll make it a good one. Um, again, synthesizing a few of the comments. Um, who takes responsibility for this? Um, so farmers, if, if a farmer wants to get started next week or next season, um, who takes responsibility? How do organizations like, uh, like Bayer, like BSF, who have a particular heritage that is not carbon farming, um, how do, they, should, should they be the ones that are so helping farmers with, with some kind of payments or uh, re reduced fees or some kind of incentive to, to drive change at, at the farmer? Does it come at the retailer end? Um, who owns the food system and who's responsible for driving rapid change that we need? So maybe I can start out with this because I think what's been really fascinating about this coalition as we've built it and as they've come along is that every single member of the coalition is stepping up and taking responsibility for this. Everyone is starting to see their role in the broader ecosystem. Everyone is really working towards how do we get to that next step? How do we get there fast? And I think there has been, uh, you know, a lot of questions around the value of coalitions. They are super complex. As Christine mentioned, we lost, launched this coalition in May. We are in a miles different place than we were even then in terms of understanding and trust and responsibility, bearing that responsibility for the change as individual organizations and as a collective. Maybe we can do change this around and do this as a round robin for everybody on the panel, including the two of you to say, what is my responsibility for the next step? So who would wanna go first on that? I'll go first, because I've been thinking a bit about this for a long time. Um, I actually think there's huge power in the consumer. And if there's one thing that I would like to see come out of our work. It's to make it easier for consumers to make the, the choice they want to make about the environmental and social impact of the food that they buy. 
because if they do that, I think it will drive change very quickly across the whole system. So transparency um, and reliable science-based measurements of impact across the whole food system, making it very easy with one click, the consumer can, uh, can, can build a basket in their online shop of food that meets their um, criteria of rightfully sourced um, food. And John, you can play a role in pushing the coalition, but as a member of the coalition from the University of Glasgow, what, what are you gonna bring in that responsibility to help with the consumer? Well, it, it, it's just bringing the science, um, the, the best science that we have available. So, so there's never scientific certainty. And so the challenge is how to, how to build in that uncertainty um, and how to get better, learn quickly with farmers in a kind of full partnership so we tend to have science being very separate from farming for far too long. Uh, I, I, I think science has at least as much to learn from farmers as <laughs> farmers have from science. Great call to action. Uh, Christine. Yeah, so then as, a, as buyer, what, what we think is important is that uh, we, and would be our responsibility is that we want the farmers to be successful. We want the farmers to be in business for now and the next decades. So, and we think that this is our responsibility to help them to access the right technologies and innovations which could support the transitions to uh, nature-based uh, solutions. So uh, our contributions to such of coalitions and don't get me wrong, uh, we really recognize that we cannot do things alone. We absolutely need all partners around the table. So that's the reasons I see a lot of value of working as a coalition, take some energy to get everybody aligned, but also it's open up mindset because we get to realize that maybe we were wrong into really understanding what the farmers were expecting from us. And also how clear we need to communicate to the rest of the uh, downstream uh, value chain. And that's where I see a lot of opportunities here and we will continue to collaborate that way. Thank you. Jörg, what are you gonna bring next? What is your responsibility? The thing that we are bringing in and try to foster is to really question the approach of thinking value chains as an externally given as something that was created by an invisible hand, as Adam Smith has said it. And we have to improve on these externally given value chains. And I think this is a wrong conception. The value chains have created by our decisions, decisions in procurement and decisions in selling. And at the moment, we only focus on that very step. We think about procurement, we think about selling. We have to become engineers of value chains. That is important for circularity. And that is important to make sure that what we do is aligned with our values. So we really have to think differently about values and differently about the value chain. And I like to call that a values chain, which we have to implement. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, thank you. So from a food, company point of view. Um, at Hero, I think the two things that we're learning and we're learning as we go is to what Jörg mentioned as well, this uh, um, the value chain rethink. For us concretely as a business and a food company that comes down to our business models. So having a more innovative and rethinking multi-actor business models. So for example, what Christine from Bayer mentioned is that with fertilizer and seed companies, we can more strongly align on our sustainable agri practices uh, with, on which or for which we're working with our suppliers and our farmers. And I think the other important role that food companies have in the brands is that we play an important role because we're right in the middle of this food value chain. So we're navigating and thinking through our engagement with our suppliers and our, our, those who are growing our food 
and we're absolutely 100% linked to our channel partners and more and more e-commerce partners, as well as consumers. So in that instance, we're serving the role as a linkage and also a catalyst. And I think it would come down to transparency. So transparency in terms of our ambition, transparency in terms of our supplier relationship management, and all the way through and coming back to the point of data that we are sharing as much and as quickly as we can with consumers and customers for this common vision of a climate-friendly farming and sustainable farming. Great, thanks for that. Alex, over to you next. What are you gonna bring? What's your responsibility? <laughs> so much, no. Um, <laughs> uh, my responsibility is as, um, as a representative of, of Yara and of Agoro Carbon, uh, which is a business built specifically to support farmers in carbon farming, it is to bring that practical insight to the coalition to contribute to this values change. I like that, by the way, this values chain uh, uh, approach um, in that very practical way, you know, bringing what we learn from working with farmers on the ground in Europe today about what practices can help them, what, what practices can be monetized and are monetizable, and in turn feed that back into the coalition's work and, and hopefully also uh, engage with the important and timely work uh, that is undertaken uh, by the, the commission as we speak, because I think that that's that's a, a really important factor here. That's you know not strictly speaking part of the coalition, but it, I think it's a, an important fact of what the coalition should be doing is being that responsible dialogue partner for policymakers. Great, and Christian, that's a good turn over to you on the policy side. Yeah, as I said in the beginning, we have one very concrete deliverable on 14th of December, a communication on sustainable carbon cycles where we want to set the, uh, the picture talking about carbon farming but also uh what's happening more more downstreams in the industry so we will also be talking about these new value chains um yeah and then we want to open really uh a big public discussion on this next year uh, because we will be working towards a more uh, technical but then legislative proposal that we call uh, certification of carbon removals that should come uh by the end of uh, of 22, where we will really tackle this, this very challenging questions of the monitoring, reporting, verification. How can we create this commodity that we need, this one ton of, uh, of carbon, and on which we then can build a lot of different uh, uh, incentives, be it labeling, be it, uh, uh, be it trading, be it insetting, be it offsetting, or whatever we want to do. But we think bringing this clarity uh, creating this, uh, uh, this commodity is the necessary first step on whatever we want to create uh, afterwards. And so I, I'm really so much looking forward to having you then over in, in Brussels next year to get all your insights, all your comments and feeding into uh, our legislative work. And we thank you for that invite. We will be there and look forward to the contributions we can bring as the coalition and as individuals. Deanna, the last word goes to you. And I think the responsibility is always with the farmer. Um, that's nothing new. That's what's expected. So what are you excited about in terms of what you've heard and where you think we can directionally help the farmers and particularly the young farmers to, to enable this transition? I'm excited because I think we've kind of, we're, we're on the right road. This idea of co-designing, of bringing in different stakeholders, different inputs about all being on the same boat and all having actually to uh, go in the same direction is finally something that is, uh, is, is refreshing. Uh, which makes me feel confident that it's actually that we will achieve the goals that we are setting for ourselves. And that makes me excited for the generation of farmers that I represent and the ones that will follow because what we need to do today is not only create conditions for my generation, but for the generation that is behind me to really understand what they will need to be able to, to live in this world, to succeed in this world 
uh, and to keep feeding the world with healthy and sustainable food. So this, um, this coalition approach is something that I feel very comfortable with because I think that nobody can do, can do it alone. Nobody is in it alone. It's not someone's problem. It's not the farming system's problem. It's a global problem. So we need this coalition uh, approach that finally does also listen to the voice of farmers, listen to the experience of farmers, but is also capable of talking to farmers because it's all about awareness. Not all farmers have that capability and, and possibility of understanding what they can do to improve their sustainability. And that is where our role comes to play. It's also making sure that the information stream goes both ways. It goes up in us helping under the industry understand what we need, the policymakers, what we need to be more sustainable, but then also bringing back those solutions that are scalable, measurable, applicable to the farmers so that we can scale up the, the, the implementation of the solution. So I think we are uh, we're definitely in the right direction. It was a it was a fantastic discussion to 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 have and and to see how everything is quite aligned. Thank you, Diana. Wonderful words to end on. Um, this has been a fascinating hour and a half. Thank you so much to our panelists, to our hosts at the University of Glasgow, and mostly to our audience. Thanks for sticking around, coming, being interested in what we're doing. We hope some of you join us on this journey as we move forward. As we've iterated many, many times, there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of responsibility coming from each and every one of us from the changes that we can make as our organizations to the changes that we can make as individuals and consumers. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of opportunity out there. And we look forward to the next phase of this journey where we get to our concrete solutions, where we work to co-create together with the farmers and with each other, um, and where we really drive that necessary impact on the ground. With that, thanks so much uh, for joining us today.